have this joke that I'll come home and she'll say, I was the tournament, and I'll say, oh, well, I lost in the finals. Or she'll say, well, you're still a winner to me. Welcome back to the Mythic Invitational Day 9 here to talk about our very next match. We're going straight into the second round. We're just going to be Martin Yuza versus Simon Gertzen, and this is a hell of a matchup. Hall of Famer Martin Yuza, 2010 PT San Diego for Simon Gertzen, and I gotta be honest, Paul, Simon Gertzen stopped doing commentary and came back to be a monster here. I mean, this is just spectacular. Yeah, this is kind of the comeback tour here for Simon, yeah. kind of retiring from coverage and then immediately qualifying yeah. for the next you know, large event that we have here. And we're excited to get the chance to talk to Simon Gertzen before this match with Becca. Hi, I'm standing here with Simon Gertzen, who's won his first match. How does it feel? Feels great. I beat uh, Javier Dominguez, who is a great player, reigning world champion. So that was a good start. Yeah, that feels pretty good. And you've brought a very interesting deck. You have the Simic Ramp, is what we're calling it, because you didn't bring Wilderness Reclamation with that uh, that Nexus of Fate. So uh, how do you think that's going to stack up in the metagame? Are you feeling good with that choice? I do. I, I just beat Esper Control, which was what I was targeting. So I, don't, I think Wilderness Reclamation is also not a bad card, but I was afraid of too many Teferis. Okay, and are you excited going forward? Are there certain decks that you're more nervous about than others? Oh, absolutely. I don't want to play White Weenie, but there aren't too many of them, uh, fortunately. And then there are some matchups which are more like 50-50, but I, I'm beating Esper, I think, so that's good. And tell me a little bit about this game that you just played against Javier. Uh, wh which, which game did you win it in, and how do you think that match went overall? Mm -hmm. So it was really quick. I won two games. Uh, he didn't win any. I, my draws were really good, his weren't, uh, but also when my deck does what it wants to do, like ramp into Tamiyo, Nissa, maybe have a negate or two to back it up, it's really difficult for Esper Control to uh, control everything at the same time. Amazing. And what was it like uh, being on the other side? Because I know you've done a lot of coverage before this. Well, it's definitely uh, thrilling. I haven't played a competitive tournaments in a long time. And this one is very different because you're sitting in front of a computer screen. So uh, I'm, I'm just enjoying the atmosphere here. Did this boost your confidence going into the next set of matches? No, I was confident before that. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Simon. It's been such a pleasure to speak to you, and I'm sure we'll see you again. You will. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Simon. It's time to talk about the head-to-head -head matchup. Both these players are currently 1-0, and oh, and it's going to be a classical deck. Esper Control, the most popular deck at this format, versus Simon Gertzen's Weird ass Simic <laughs> deck, Paul. Let's talk about this matchup. Yeah, so the the, the you know the, the team that uh, Martin Hughes has been a part of, you know, he's playing Esper Control here. And you know, the reason why they chose to play Esper Control is because Kaya's Wrath is very well positioned going into this event. Yes. But Simon actually playing a deck that kind of preys on that thought process because Simon doesn't have a lot of creatures in his deck and he's just looking to ramp and just play a bunch of Nexus of Fates. Yeah, and there's a number of really weird absences from the Simic Ramp deck. There is no Wilderness Reclamation. There's sideboard tech with Palaka Worm, my favorite card in the history of Magic the Gathering. We got mass manipulations there. And I'm really interested to see Martin Yuzu, who has some of the more light conservative touches in the Esper Control deck, running just a pair of Basilica Bellhaunt, still relying on that core of the 11 Planeswalkers, eight Teferis, and three Narsets. Yeah. And I, I've heard a lot of people say that Simon's deck could possibly be the deck to win the tournament. Yeah, he was very happy with how the metagame broke down. And you know, one yeah. of the primary reasons he's not playing Wilderness Reclamation is this is a metagame feel filled with Teferi Time Raveler, and that Planeswalker single-handedly shuts down all the things that you could do right, with right, the mana right. that you get from Reclamation. Very excited to get this match underway. Becca, who's coming out? <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to tell you, Day 9. All right, coming to the stage right now, the Hall of Famer from the Czech Republic on Esper Control, one of the greatest limited players of all time. We have Martin Yuza. to the coverage team, Pro Tour San Diego Champion 2010 with the Simic Ramp deck that's surprising us all, it's Simon Gertzen. Phillips 
are going to help you out with the call of this next match. Thank you very much, Becca. That's right. We are going to see Martin Yuza versus Simon Gertsen, who seems very confident that he can take care of any Esper Control or Esper Hero deck that's in his way. Cedric, do you think that's what we're going to see happen now? Well, this is one of my favorite things about Magic. When you have a deck and you feel as though you've pegged the metagame, as Simon feels as though he has right now, then life is pretty good. He's already beaten Esper Control in the hands of Javier Dominguez last round. And he's playing against Martin Yuza, who is also playing Esper Control. So if Simon has nailed things here, then this should be a pretty easy win and moving on to 2-0. However, much like Javier, Martin is a very, very good Magic player. Indeed, so one of the best. there's no guarantee of a victory here. However, if things do shake out the way that Simon's expecting them to, I believe he has advantaged in this matchup. His deck is built in such a fashion that this should be pretty smooth sailing. There's a lot of fours in his deck. That means his deck is looking to do the same thing every single time as opposed to what we saw with Andre Strasky last round with his build of Esper Hero where it can do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This deck is trying to do one thing, ramp into big spells. Big spells in the payoffs here for Simon's Simic ramp deck is Nissa Who Shakes the World, Tamiyo Collector of Tales to Bridge the Gap, four copies of Nexus of Fate, and then four copies of Hydroid Crisis, notably Alias. Mm -hmm. No copies of Wilderness Reclamation, as Simon talked about. So think about our last match between Paulo and Autumn. How bad did Wilderness Reclamation look against Teferi? Oh, yeah, because Teferi's just like, oh, hey, that enchantment you got there? Nope, go back to your hand. Thank you very much. So Simon says, I'm not going to play Wilderness Reclamation because I expect it to be a lot of Teferi's, which he was right about. Correct. He nailed that. So when you take a look at a Simic Ramp or Simic Nexus deck, the first card most people put on their deck list is Wilderness Reclamation because when that's going, things are so easy. Simon has gone without that card. It looks genius. Let's see if it pays off. We are ready to get underway here. Both players taking a look at their opening hands. Martin Yuza keeps his. He is happy with the concoction that is in his hand. And we're taking a look now at Simon Gertzen taking a mulligan there and keeping the next hand. Nissa, who shakes the world, is going to go to the bottom of the deck. So we're going to kick things off here. We've got two Tamios. Tamio is very, very key in this matchup, or in this deck for Simon allowing him to dig through his deck and, uh, yeah, just fill the graveyard with things you don't want, I suppose. Simon's hand is pretty good here. It's a mulligan to six. Um, he does have two copies of Grow Spiral now. He just drew one for his draw step after scrying Nissa, who shakes the world to the bottom. Uh, if you're Simon, again, this is a situation where the games are going to go pretty long. Ideally, what's going to take place here is he's able to hit his land drops, work himself towards his big payoffs. He's got two copies of Tamiyo in hand, so kind of breaking this up, which was what Martin would like to do with a Slaughter Racer, really isn't going to work. So if you're actually Simon on a mulligan here, you're actually kind of happy because you've got a hand that Thought Eraser can't pick apart by itself. You have redundant copies of Gross Spiral, redundant copies of Tamiyo, and then Blink of an Eye is not really a card that you want to select. So Kai's Wrath for the Surveil, unsurprisingly going to the graveyard. <laughs> yeah, like we, see, like we saw in the last match, the Wraths aren't going to be doing very much here at all for the Esper players. So just, you know, getting the lands on the board, establishing each other's sides. We might see Teferi Time Reveler hit the board next. We've also got... Uh, Tamio and a Hydroid Crisis waiting to come out there for Simon Gertzen. So Drowned Catacomb will be the play. And what do we start things off with? There we go. It's a fairy time raveler. So this kind of demonstrates beautifully exactly what's going on with Simon's deck, where for Autumn, Teferi Time Reveler showing up last round was a giant headache and bad news. For Simon, you're just like, okay, that's fine. You know, yeah. you don't really have anything to bounce. I don't really care. You don't have an ultimate you're working towards because there's no such thing on the card. So whereas that card would be the ultimate card to worry about, if you're Simon, it's just like, okay, well, I've got my Planeswalker of my own, and it's better than yours. <laughs> exactly right. And we saw there firing off that growth spiral just before little T hits the board because, as we know, Teferi doesn't let you play at instant speed. Bad Teferi, no biscuit. Tamio now on the board, and Simon is contemplating, what do I want to go digging for? What's interesting what here, a couple copies of Gross Spiral in the graveyard, and there's well, there's a copy of Gross Spiral in the graveyard and a Tamio in the graveyard. So Simon right now is thinking, what do I want to find? His deck is full of four ofs, so percentages of hitting and all that stuff is, I'm sure, things that he's thinking about because he has a very analytical mind. However, I'm very curious reason. to see what he is going to name. That's what he is thinking about here. He's already got a Hydroid Crisis in hand, and he's actually going to go with Jade Light Ranger, which is a name that makes a lot of sense to me because the one thing that he's missing right now, Alias, is lands. That is correct, and we see Akaya's Wrath off the top there for Martin Yuza. It still doesn't have a target, but it might find one shortly because we do see that Hydroid Crisis in the hand of Simon Gertzen. Oath of Kaya now getting played. Going to deal three damage to Tamio. We don't want you getting too high there, madam, and we're going to return Oath of Kaya back to the hand to replay it the next turn. 
Now you got to think if if you're sitting in Martin's seat right now, you're not thrilled with how things are going. This is already not a great matchup for you, given how Simon has built his deck and your draw is not very good. Teferi is not the card you're really looking for in this matchup. You're ideally looking for bigger Teferi as opposed to small Teferi. Oath of Kef Oath of Kai doesn't really have a lot of text, and yeah, sure, Kai's Wrath can kill Hydroid Crisis, but those are the kind of exchanges that Simon is happy with because he's drawn at least one card and potentially two with the Jellyfish Hydra. So <laughs> those all these exchanges thus far in the game are very favorable for Gertz and, and not Yuza. So Tamiyo, again, looking for the Jade Light Ranger, not finding anything, still filling up that graveyard with a whole bunch of goodies that Tamiyo can bring back later if needs be. Go Spiral again, firing off in the main phase, playing the land down. And uh, yeah, we got the option here for Blink of an Eye or Hydro Crisis, but Gertzen just holding holding back, waiting, waiting well, a little bit. Well, right now, Blink of an Eye is off the table because of Tamiyo being, or excuse me, because of Teferi being on the battlefield. Yeah. So we're not going to see that. And Hydroid Crisis, unsurprisingly, Simon would like to dump all of his mana into that as opposed to just making oh, yeah. it a 2-2 two -two and drawing a card. So the one thing to note right now, if you are Simon, is that you've got a Tamiyo that's on four that Oath of Kai cannot kill. So your powerful Planeswalker is still going to be on the battlefield at the end of this turn, moving into your next turn, which is good news. So Oath of Kaya dealing the three damage, gaining the three life. Could fire off the Thought Eraser here, but decides not to just yet. I think we might see it in the draw step, maybe, here from Martin. He's, he's, he seems to be waiting. It's like he's waiting for the exact right moment to fire off this Thought Eraser and just really irritate Simon Gertzen. Because I don't know about you, but I get really annoyed when someone Thought Erasers in my hand. It's like, stop touching my stuff. Play with your own. Of course. That is, of course, what the Esper Control deck wants to do. It wants to attack the resources, get rid of all the key cards from the other players' hands, and we're going to see the Hydroid Crisis make an appearance here. Yep, this one makes a lot of sense. Going to draw a couple of cards, gain a little bit of life. Again, life not going to matter a ton here in this matchup. There's hey, a Jade Light the Ranger. Ranger you were looking for. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, what do we name now that we have found the Jade Light Ranger? Do we go for Jade Light Ranger again? We'll find out shortly. Yeah, that's the question is, you know, it, are we in Nexus. search of payoffs? There we go. Yeah. Oh, found one. Yeah, we are in search of payoffs right now. If you are Simon, you want to take additional turns and start to build an advantage with your Planeswalkers and your creatures. So that name makes a lot of sense. I think Simon's thinking right now, I got plenty of mana to work with, hey. and now it's time to find time to find some payoffs. Come on, the Dreadhorde. Talk about payoffs. That's a pretty good card for Martin user. There's a bunch of goodies in that graveyard that Tamiyo has been so diligently putting there for him. So, the, yeah, that's a pretty good card to grab, isn't it? So that's a game breaker. That's definitely a game breaker. It's a card that Martin doesn't play a ton of copies of. And in combination with Teferi, we could see him use this in a very unique way. But it looks like he's going to go towards the minus with the Time Raveler. Maybe he clicks the cancel button. So maybe not. Maybe he doesn't want to give up that passive ability of Teferi. And seeing that Nexus of Fate in hand. Hmm. No, we're going to go for it, returning the Oath of Kaya to the hand, finding another Teferi. Little T just has a way of replacing himself. It's where they work in pairs. Oath of Kaya again getting rid of Tamiyo. No digging in the graveyard for you. Thought Erasure going to get rid of. What do we pick here? This is a good exchange here for Martin. Oath of Kaya taking care of the Tamiyo is very nice. That card was causing some trouble. So that's step one of trying, trying to get himself back into this game. Now the selection process is somewhat difficult here. Growth Spiral, easy to say you can keep that. Blink of an Eye, it's flexible. Maybe not the card you're that, they're that worried about. Though he is hovering over it and at least giving it consideration. I don't think he cares very much about Jade Light Ranger. So I think it's between Blink and Nexus of Fate. And he's going to go with Blink. We'll see where the Narset's going to land with the Surveil. Narset staying on top of the library. So just going to be another way for user to dig through his deck, find some answers. Nexus of Fate getting fired off there by Simon. And he's going to take a few extra turns. Let's see how many he can get going. So I like this play here from Simon because he plays this on the upkeep as opposed to during his main phase. He's mm -hmm. going to play that on his upkeep, give himself the highest percentage chance to draw the card again which is very smart because he'd like to chain them together to try to deal as many points of damage with Hydroid Crisis as he can. So smart play there from Gertzen. Wouldn't expect anything from a Pro Tour champion, winning Pro Tour San Diego all the way back in 2010. Oh, there we go. He found the other one, but he doesn't have the mana to replay it. So he's going to have to wait a turn and uh, try and get rid of Little Teferi if he wants to keep going with his Nexus of Fate. Lanwar Elf and possibly Jadad Ranger are going to hit the board. No, we're going to hang on there. 
Do you think he sniffs the Wrath? I mean, he's going to be a little bit careful. He is yeah. playing He is playing against a Kai's Wrath deck, so he doesn't actually need to put a ton of stuff on the battlefield right now to all get swept away. He can kind of do it incrementally mm -hmm. in combination with Nexus of Fate. So I actually think this is a pretty smart play here from Simon of just saying, you know what, I'll add a Land of War Elves to the battlefield. That in combination with the Hydroid Crisis may make you use a Kai's Wrath if you have one. So we might see Narset Parta of Veils hit the board here. Let's see what he decides to do. Contemplating this very carefully. Do I want to play Teferi? Do I want to play Narset? Both very powerful three mana planeswalkers. It's going to be Narset. And we're going for the immediate minus two. Let's take a look for something else. Cast down, not a bad one. Another Commander Dreadhorde, not necessary right now. But Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, is the pick. And Kaya's Wrath getting rid of those two pesky creatures on the board. So, we're still able to fire off that Nexus of Fate whenever we want to. Jade Light Ranger first, though. Let's go exploring. What do we find on the top? Another Nexus of Fate? Yes, please. Thank you very much. This isn't bad. Simon looks... He's a pretty good spot here, right? Simon's deck is interesting. With the, with the configuration of his deck, he is so much less a Wilderness Reclamation Nexus of Fate deck with the obvious exclusion of, of Wilderness Reclamation of being your traditional Simic Nexus deck. That's why we branded this deck Simic Ramp because his ability to just, say, play a Jade Light Ranger and an Incubation Druid and then Nexus plus Nexus and that's multiple attacks towards Planeswalkers or your life totals means that he's trying to string together time walks to get the games done. It may look a little bit surprising to see Nexus Fate left on top of the deck here, but again, the thought process is, all right, my Jay Light Ranger is going to be able to smack something multiple times. Yep. It could be it could be Martin's life total. It could be Martin's life total plus a Planeswalker, but multiple attacks could be beneficial here. So it looks a little bit strange, but Simon certainly knows what he's doing with his very unorthodox deck for this tournament. So we see the other Koth of uh, oh, Oath of Kaya. Koth of Aya. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. Oath of Kaya. <laughs> the second one. But we do also have Commander Dreadhorde. Is there any consideration to fire off the Commander Dreadhorde now, knowing that Nexus of Fate is going to start whittling away at the life total? I mean, there's consideration for a lot of things right now if you're Martin because you have so many options at your Ooh, disposal. He does look like he's considering Command the Dreadhorde here uh, because there are a lot of options at his disposal for this particular card. And his life total is high enough to return enough things that do matter. And this is a game swinging Ooh, play. Here we go. So you have Nexus, I have Dreadhorde. I also have a bunch of your stuff that I'm not going to use to my benefit. What do we name here if we are Martin user? We can send something back. We can go digging for things. Maybe a Basilica Bellhorn just to pad the life total, perhaps. We don't know, but let's find out. What do we got here? Yes, Basilica Bellhorn is going to be the card. Do we find it on top of the deck? We do not. But we do have the cost down available to get rid of one of these Jade Lights. We're sending back the Incubation Druid with the Fairy Time Rabbit drawing a card, finding the other land. That's great, so you can leave up a blocker and cost down at your will. Yeah, this exchange and this entire turn here for Martin's really, really nice. He got to it's do fantastic. a lot in one turn. He did have to go down to nine life to do so, but now you're going to get to see multiple spells in one turn, which is always a goal when you are playing Magic, especially in the standard format. So the ability to play Command the Dreadhorde plus cast down in one turn and activate a couple of Planeswalkers, you see the Drowned Catacomb coming in, and we can't forget about the Teferi bouncing that Incubation Druid last turn as well. It has set Simon back in a Ooh. very, very big way. The Elder Spell we saw earlier in a game where the Elder Spell was used to kill their own Planeswalkers to get something just, you know, at, at the point where it could ultimate and still stay on the board. So that could be an option there because Simon doesn't have any Planeswalkers to speak of right now. Yeah, so this is an interesting option that's also at Martin's disposal. When you see a, when you see a battlefield like this, life is at your, excuse me, at, you know, the... The world is your oyster, yeah. is the saying <laughs> that I like to use, and many others do as well. You know, because he's got all these planeswalkers to use. He has the ability to play Teferi plus the Outer Spell in the same turn, and then ultimate the Teferi and start vacuuming up all the permanents like we saw in our previous match uh, with Autumn Burchett and Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. So we could see something similar here. Though I will say that that sort of play is not necessary this game in order to win this game. It is just one of many options that Martin has at his disposal. If he'd like to go that route, he certainly can. And we may see him do that, but with so many Planeswalkers on the battlefield, it isn't a necessary thing to do to win this game because the only area of this game that he's oh, not winning go. is life total. But we're going to see this happen right now, it looks like, with here the Elder Spell. Here we go. Elder Spell now getting rid of the unnecessary Planeswalkers. We hate to call them that, but you know what? They're getting sacrificed to to increase the loyalty on Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, I believe. Or Nissa? Nah, nah. It's I mean, going to be Teferi, there right? Are, there are options. It's, this Again, this is what Martin's thinking about. It's going to be Big T. It doesn't surprise me to see it go towards Big T, but there are options at his disposal, so we watch him 
move this direction. And he's he, he's go. shaking his head a little bit, trying to trying to maybe hide a <laughs> smile. Simon Gertzen going, whoops. Did he make an oopsie, or is uh, Simon just uh, poking at him a little bit? There? No, no. I think uh, I think there's no oops here for Martin at all. I think <laughs> I think Martin is very happy with where he's at in this particular game. He's resolved to command the Dreadhorde. His life total is the only thing that's only it's a little bit under duress, but that's his own doing mm -hmm. uh, with the command of the Dreadhorde. And there's just an incubation druid on the battlefield, so there's really nothing to be scared of right now if you're Martin. And so here comes a copy of Thought Eraser. Yeah, the Thought Eraser that Tamiya brought back from the graveyard. Oh, Taking a look and seeing both Nexus of Fates. This will, this will get shuffled back into the library, sending the planes into the bin. And yeah, this is a very commanding position for Martin Yuza. I mean, Martin's got everything that he needs. The longer oh, yeah. this game goes, the worse it is. Uh, for Simon, he's going to have to try to steal this one. I'm not entirely sure how he can do that. I suppose step one is playing Nexus of Fate. Mm -hmm. Getting in for the three damage. Well, you know, he could string together Nexuses. Martin is it? No. Oh, no. Hello. Wait, hold on a minute. Wait. So Can he do this? So this is an attack for three. He gets another turn. Nissa. I actually think I actually think Simon literally just stole this game with he the perfect draw stuff. have. Yeah, I actually think he just stole this game with the perfect draw stuff. Yep. Totally I think he just stole that. this game Nessa with the perfect draw stuff. Oh, oh, look at Martin's face. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, Are you kidding me? You top decked that. Oh, no. Martin, you did oh. it to yourself with the command of the Dreadhorde, my man. Oh, no. That is such a feels bad, but Simon Gertzen's got to be feeling real good right now. What a top deck. All right, let's go to sideboards here. What do we do? Ah, uh, Simon, you still got it, my friend. Never lost it, one could argue. We're going to take a look at Martin's sideboard here with the Ixlans binding, a couple Ooh. of copies of Lyra Dawnbringer. Duresses are unsurprisingly going to come in here. Uh, not sure how many copies of the other spell Martin wants to bring in. It's the same question that Paulo had to ask himself last round against Autumn Burchett of how many copies of that card am I supposed to bring in? Look at him shaking his head. He's like, how even? That's what magic does sometimes. It sometimes the top deck gods just favor your opponent. It can. You know, it was, it, again, unsurprisingly, Simon played his handful of turns beautifully, gave himself the best chances to win with the upkeep copies of Nexus of Fate, so on and so forth. Um, Simon, a great magic player. I know we think of him as a, mostly a commentator, and commentators are normally washed up. Oh, he's a phenomenal, up, phenomenal player. He is a former Pro Tour champion. We cannot forget that. As far as Martin is concerned, again, he's got some nice options at his disposal, but he does have to ask himself the same questions that Paulo asked last round about how much removal am I supposed to have in my deck after sideboard because I did just lose to creatures. It is worth noting Simon does have more creatures than Autumn did because Simon is not playing with Wilderness Reclamation. So Simon does have Incubation Druid, Jaylight Ranger, and War Elves, which means that the Kai's Wraths are still going to be good here. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Martin just leave all three copies in and maybe board in more removal. We'll see. There are some... Yeah. This, is, this is Simon's whole plan this entire weekend, which is he's going to make life really tough for Esper control players, assuming there's a lot of them in the tournament, which there are. Oh, yes, indeed. Over a third of the field, I believe, are playing Esper. Roughly that. I mean, yeah. this is this was a beautiful choice here from Simon. Now, that was a game I actually thought he was going to lose. But the fact that he was able to steal that game, this is really, really good news for him. This is the deck that he came here to beat. Yep. And in magic tournaments like this, you have to beat the decks that you're supposed to beat. You can't give games away against decks that you feel like you're so advantaged against. So we're going to watch game number two begin. All right, starting things off with Lanor Elf on the board. And we're going to ramp up, hopefully, into something bigger. We're going to see turn two, Jaylight Ranger, potentially. But the Thought Ranger might just say, no, thank you. I don't feel like seeing that on the board. What does Martin use a pick here? Well, Thought Eraser is interesting in this spot. Jaylight uh, gone. As it oftentimes is. I think taking Jaylight is pretty smart. And now Martin's working with the information about the Negate and the Thorn Lieutenant. The only thing that Martin doesn't know is the top card of Simon's deck, which we'll find out here momentarily as he surveils a Elder Spell to the graveyard. So Simon following things up with the Thorn Lieutenant. Lenny the Land War Elf is going to get in for one point of damage because why not? He's not doing anything. You know, you've got to pull your weight here. And this is one of those spots as Duress is going to take this negate here in just a moment where Martin Steck needs to kind of cough up a Kaya's Wrath now because uh, Simon's just going to keep pressuring him. Yeah. So he's sideboarded into this creature package, much like we saw last round with Autumn against Paulo. You know, I, I like to refer to our previous matches because, you know, maybe the past can predict the future. <laughs> it's all about giving beatdowns now. You take a look at Martin's hand. He's got a couple copies of Teferi Hero of Dominaria, and that is it. His draw step yielded a watery Oof. grave. That's not particularly useful. So, not at all. What is worth noting is that Simon elected not to deploy another copy of yep. Thorn Lieutenant. He kept that there just in case because we all fear the four mana step of the Esper Control. But here we're going to see Nissa, who shakes the world, start shaking some life total away from Martin User. 
getting this land in action, and we're going to swing in for six points of damage. So this is absolutely horrible news here for Martin. Nissa coming onto the battlefield is going to allow Simon to attack here for five points of damage because Lana Elves was used to generate the oh, mana yes, for the Nissa. Correct. So gonna gonna target Lenny the forest. Sleeping. Come Seven in here for five. Curious if we're gonna see the Thorn Lieutenant come down. Looks like he's gonna continue to hold it. Now it's an option here for Martin of which Deferius do you want to play? None of them are great right now because Nissa's on the battlefield and there's no clean way to take care of it and have your planeswalker survive. So we could see Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, come down and tuck Nissa away, and then Lana War Elves can finish it off. Thorn Lieutenant in the forest can continue to pressure Martin, or you could see Teferi Time Elver come down and bounce something, but Either way it shakes out, Martin is in really, really bad shape right now because of the Nissa that was peeled off the top of the deck there by Simon. And you can see Simon, uh, he's got a little bit of a, a grin going on oh, here yeah. in the top left-hand corner. He N knows. Nissa is 100% MVP of this matchup so far. And you can see just holding on to that Thorn Lieutenant, just being like, I know you have the Wrath, I respect it, but these guys are going to get it done because this Thorn Lieutenant can pump itself up it can get in for great points of damage, especially with Nissa on the board, adding that extra green mana per forest. So, yeah, we might see some uh, big swings here. Yeah, there's no reason for Simon to here deploy this other copy of Thorn Lieutenant. As you mentioned, Nissa's tapping, uh, is generating more green mana, so that means the Thorn Lieutenant can use its pump ability. It's a 6-7 now. You're going to get a 3-3 land, and, and the Lana Royals probably wants to party too, but take care of Teferi. Yeah, yeah, he's going to take, take care of Teferi. The other two are doing their job. They're getting rid of this life total here. Two life left. For Martin Yuza, he needs something to help him out, and I well, don't think he's going to find Martin's it. Martin's in the spot now. There's, there's nothing he can draw to get himself out of the situation. Kaya's Wrath. He needed the Wrath. Kaya's Wrath doesn't even do it. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Kaya's Wrath doesn't do it because it'll kill all of these creatures, and then Nissa will just generate a 3-3 and get the game over with. If you're Simon, you've put yourself in the position of there's nothing my opponent can draw to get themselves out of this game. So sure, deploy your Teferi here of Dominaria. Feel good about doing that because that card is so good. But Martin, as you are That's going to draw so a card on to top two lands, Look, Godless Shrine ain't it. There is nothing that is nothing it. And Simon Gertzen, Simon. folks. Holy moly. Nissa, who shakes the world, just putting in so much work there for Simon. And his deck is doing exactly what he wants it to do. That was incredible. You, when you come into a tournament of 68 players, and you know the majority of these players as Simon does, because Simon has been around for so long, you can kind of hone in on what you believe these players are going to select. Further, you can take a look at the meta game, pull the lens back and say, I think players are going to play these sort of decks and why. Then, in a tournament like this, that is so small and not that many rounds, it is, it is I believe, beneficial to take a gamble. And that is exactly what Simon has done. Simon, when he talked to Becca earlier, said, I don't want to play against white aggressive decks. Lucky for you, Simon, <laughs> I'm not in this tournament. I don't want to play against white aggressive decks. So with that in mind, he says, I'm, I don't think there's going to be that many of those. If I play against them, I'm dead. Fine. Yeah. That's totally fine. Um, but if I don't think there's many of them, and I know the players in this tournament, they kind of, they like Esper strategies, right? There's a lot of people who like Esper strategies. Esper has been performing well on Magic Arena in real-life tournaments. What's the deck that I can play that can beat that kind of deck doesn't lose to Teferi, and you know what? If I play against an aggressive strategy, I lose. He might have it. Now, we watched Autumn last round, right? Yep. Playing Simic Nexus, and I think that was their plan, too. But I think Simon's deck is kind of the evolution of what Autumn and Emma wanted to get to. The cutting of Wondrous Reclamation, that's the kind of thing, right, where when you're building this kind of deck, you just go, okay, first cards, Nexus, this other stuff. But... I think Simon's made a beautiful choice. It's awesome. I think so. I think he might have this down pat. Yeah. Let's send it to Maria. Hey, thanks so much, Alias. Yeah, tons of great players in this room here today. So much talent, including a number of world champions, which is, of course, the title that every player wants to achieve in their life. Shahar Shenhar here, your 2013 champion, just 19, the youngest champion ever when he beat Reed Duke there. 2014 wins again over Patrick Chapin. Right now, currently tied at one and one. He's playing CJ Steele, who is your 2012 Friday Night Magic champion uh, tournament that happened at Gen Con. And of course, of course, that's his arena username, so pretty cool stuff there. Seth Manfield, your 2015 champion, also in the building. Uh, he mo was motivated by the birth of his daughter, of course, when he won that tournament. It was very emotional for him, really cool stuff. Currently leading over anime, one game to zero. William Huey Jensen, also in the building, your 2017 world champion, winning, of course, in his hometown with his family watching. His dad seeing him win that tournament, very emotional as well. He will be up uh, playing John Rolfe. Then Javier Dominguez, your current 
reigning world champion, of course, winning the tournament after coming in second the year before. So really awesome stuff there. And we're going to get to see him play Luis Scott Vargas coming up. So you're not going to want to miss that matchup. Both of our players starting out 0-1 here. So their matchup is on the way. But first, of course, Becca Scott's with our winner, the guy in the awesome shirt. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. That's right. I'm back with Simon Gertz. And Simon, how does it feel to beat a Hall of Fame 2-0? It feels great. Uh, it shows me that uh, picking this deck to beat Esper Control is actually working because until then it was just a theory. You know, these players play on a different level, but it is difficult with Kaya's Wrath and all these Planeswalkers to beat my aggression plus Planeswalkers and Nexus of Fate as the top end. Yeah, and at the end there, it didn't seem like even Akaya's Wrath would have helped him. Was that something that you planned for? Did you did you see that incoming? Oh yeah, I mean, I play this matchup uh, knowing about Kaya's Wrath from turn one of game one, effectively. And then I don't expose too many creatures. You might have seen me hold back Jade Light Ranger. And uh, that way, I kind of try to use his weapons against him, if that makes sense. Yeah, always have something in your back pocket that he's not expecting. Is there anything you sideboarded in there that was interesting? Well, I have the I have the negate, which is uh, clear. But I think the most interesting sideboard card is probably Thorn Lieutenant, which just puts on even more pressure and makes it more difficult for him to do anything uh, reasonable with Teferi and Snarset. Yeah, absolutely, especially when your Nis is out and can help you with mana to be able to pump. Now, I know it's a little early. It's just 2-0 and for your matches so far, but are you eyeing that, that world championship spot that comes along with winning this tournament? Uh, for now, I'm eyeing four more wins, and we'll talk after that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Simon, for talking to me again. I have a feeling I'll be seeing more of you. Thanks to you guys at home for watching. Stay tuned. We have more magic coming up right now, a short break. Abby, but down to two life. That will do it. I am Andrea Mengucci, I'm from Italy. I am 25 and I'm a professional magic player. Since I was a kid, like I started playing magic at the beach. It's basically been the only game that I've been playing. I was a really, really good at sports, so I was just more like playing on the computer, but always magic. You just became the first champion of the Magic Invitational! So I finished my study last year and I was like, okay, great. 2010 will be my professional year. I'll be playing professionally Magic. Hi, I'm Martin Uza. I'm from the Czech Republic, and I play a lot of Magic. In high school, my friends were playing this interesting game, and I just, you know, I was interested, so I asked them what, the, what it is, and it's this, you know, cool strategy game, and, like, before I knew it, I was buying packs and just, like, had a, had a huge collection and everything, and, like, and as the time went by, I started playing tournaments and went to PPQs and whatever, and, and now we're here. When I got the phone call, it was an exciting moment. It was just, like, you know, there's a lot of things running through your head, and you're, like, Oh, we finally made it. This is great. This is all we ever wanted. My name is Luis Salvato. I am from Argentina. The first time my brother bought some portal decks. We learn how to play, and then 10 years ago, I'm playing professional level. Faxon says that's enough to kill me. Luis Salvato is your. My family and my friends support me a lot. When I found out that I was in the MPL, that I was selected for that, everyone, mostly me, was super excited about this. My name is William Jensen, nicknamed Huey, and I'm here today because I'm a member of the Magic Pro League. I first started playing Magic in 1997. It didn't take me very long to become competitive and start going to tournaments. I was going to weekly tournaments 
on, on a couple weeknights a week and even Saturdays and I really liked the, the atmosphere and I definitely found somewhere where I felt like I belong. Welcome back to the Mythic Championship 3 here in Las Vegas. We have more magic action for you and it's going to be an Esper Control Mirror. Cedric, this is going to be a good one. Both players at 0 and 1. So they are fighting to get back into this. We're going to see Luis Scott Vargas and Javier Dominguez. Well, it's going to be probably a pretty long one. So uh, if you're a coffee drinker out there, which I'm not, might want to get one of those and settle in because it could uh, it could take a while as these players have two very similar decks. Yes, indeedy. Let's get right into the action now as we take a look at the opening hands. Oath of Kaya, Zaplenty, Teferi, Cry of the Carnarium. So Cedric, in this matchup, there's not a whole bunch of things to kill, correct? So these Wraths, you don't want to see in your hand. So in this matchup between these two players, they have five creatures between them in their main deck. For uh, for Javier, he's got three copies of Basilic Bell Hunt. For Luis, he's got two. So these games are going to go very long. They're going to they're going to revolve around two things in particular: hitting your land drops and planeswalkers. Those are the most important things to get things started. However, Dominguez has a card that Luis does not have at the moment, and that is Search for His Kanto, which does a nice job of doing both of the things I just mentioned, oh, hitting yeah. your land drops and finding your planeswalkers. Eventually, that card will transform. Yeah, Search, of, Search for His Kanto as well, allowing him to get rid of any of the removal spells, which are, for the most part, going to be complete blanks in this matchup. We see Teferi, Time Raveler, now on the side of Javier Dominguez. He's going to start digging through his deck, finding more answers, and... Narset part of Veils down on the board for LSV. One thing you just want to do when you're watching Ooh, these games is just, of those. you just want to keep a count of how many cards they're drawing that are not relevant. So for Luis right now, and you take a look at his hand, irrelevant cards, Cry the Carnarium, Cast Down, Kaya's Wrath. On Javier Dominguez's side, he has a Kaya's Wrath and a Cast Down. So right now, as far as irrelevant cards are concerned, Luis has more of them. Next, I want to look at number of lands each player has in their hand. For Luis, at the moment, zero. For Javier, he's got a Glacial Fortress in hand, and he's just drawn a Watery Grave. So. Javier is going to be able to do the things that matter more at the early stages of this game, which is hitting land drops and playing Planeswalkers. We'll see if Luis can keep up with Ooh. his Narset. He missed the fourth land, though, so that might come back to haunt him. But, uh, yeah, let's see what we're digging for here with Narset. There's a Teferi. There's a Thought Erasure. Any consideration to take that just to see what he's up against? Well, I'm sure there is some. The problem here for Luis is that he doesn't have access to Black Mana, so it might just be to, re to redeploy a Narset right now. And so the new Narset will start with five counters and will whittle its way down to three. Uh, notably, Narset does not find lands, so the Spark is going to be the find. I think Luis actually going to have to discard here. Two discard cards. two cards, yeah. Wow, that's something uh, something you really don't want to see. LSV hoping for that fourth land drop. We've got to keep up with Javier Dominguez in this battle of the card advantage. Let's, Let's see what we find. Teferi here of Dominaria now on the board for Javier Dominguez. He's going to start... Well, no, he's uh, he's sending Narset back to the library. Well, can't draw any cards because Narset's on the battlefield. True. So yes, Teferi's plus is going to be ineffective. What Luis needed really badly was a black source for the Oath of Kaya's that are in his hand. Oath of Kaya, normally you're going to see that killing creatures, right? You think of it being able to damage Planeswalkers second. However, the ability to kill Teferi on this turn and then the other Oath of Kaya probably being able to kill the other Teferi is a very, very, very big go. deal. Though that Teferi is up to four counters now. Here we see another Teferi hero of Dominaria on the board, now able to draw cards. You know how many times I've forgotten about Narset's passive? Oh, that card is so frustrating, especially if you're playing like Izzet Phoenix or something like that. But uh, yeah, it can be equally annoying in this matchup where you want to draw cards, you want to refill your hand and just have that advantage over your opponent. This is going to be a draw step thought eraser here from Luis. Luis may, actually he can't respond, pardon me, because of Teferi Time Raveler being on the battlefield. So this should just be resolving here in just a moment. The good news here for Luis is that he does have a copy of Oath of Kaya and Dispark in hand to be able to take care of, uh, should be able to at least start to manage Teferi Hero of Dominaria. So this isn't so bad, but it's not ideal. So LSV's own Teferi hitting the bin, able to run out the fourth, fifth land eventually, and D-Spark is going to get rid of Pardon Big Teeth on the other side of the battlefield. Both of Kaya as well coming down and going to uh, gonna just, you know, smack Little T for three points of damage there, taking him down to one. And again, Tef you see what I mean? Teferi, they like travel in packs. They always they just replace themselves all the time. So, so Big T back quickly. on the board. 
LSV is probably thinking, gosh, what do I have to do to get rid of you, Big T? Well, he's got some work to do this now because these two copies of cast down are quite idea. poor. This Narset could be a step in the right direction. Needs to find a way to get Big T off of the battlefield with this Narset, assuming it does resolve, of course. So life is getting pretty difficult here for Luis. We'll see if Narset can actually get him back no, into this game. No Thought Eraser is okay, but it doesn't solve the problems that are on the battlefield. Not too shabby. He really doesn't want these cast downs in hand. He probably wishes they were something a little more useful. So when it comes time to sideboarding, we're going to see a lot of these creature removal spells going out. Well, this is, uh, this is you know, part of the problem, but also one of the reasons to play Asper Control. You're so good against creature strategies, mm. but in the mirror match, you're both going to draw some pretty poor cards over the course of the game, and then it becomes about who draws more of the relevant cards. Thus far, it has been Javier Dominguez, who has now transformed his Ascanta into Ascanta, of course, the very Sucking powerful yep. legendary land, and he's got two active planeswalkers on the battlefield. So life is good for your reigning world champion. So to Ascanta activation, Finding the Elder Spell, ooh, that's a big thing to find. We're going to get rid of that Narset, perhaps, and LSV has seen enough. He knows that he is way behind here, not going to catch up with what he had available to him. So let's go to sideboards. What are we doing? I think it's a very smart concession there by Luis. I do want to touch on that very quickly. He's very far behind in that in this particular game. These rounds are timed, so it is worth mentioning that these games can go a little bit long. Yes. When you are that far behind on the battlefield and as far as relevant cards are in hand, it is prudent to say, you know what, let's move on to the next game. So Luis is <laughs> going to do something very simple. Get this creature removal spells out. Yep. Highs, rats, cast downs, all that other garbage. Get your relevant cards in, your duresses, some of your counter magic, more copies of Dispark, and just move forward that way. You know, th these games and these mirror matches, I don't want to say they're straightforward and simple, but they can be yep. with regards to what you're trying to accomplish. Both these players are Hall of Fame level players. Of course, Luis already in. I'm sure Javier will be in at some point over his illustrious magic career. They know what they need to do. Hit your land drops, find your planeswalkers, find answers to the planeswalkers, move forward accordingly. Javier was able to do that off of the back of Search for his Kanta. That's why he is up one game to zero. Indeed, if you are just joining us, we are looking at Javier Dominguez and Luis Scott Vargas, both at 0 and 1. So they are fighting to pick up their first win of this tournament here in Las Vegas. Javier Dominguez just considering sideboard options just a little more closely, wanting to give himself the best chance of going. 2-0. and oh. It is surprising to see both these players starting this tournament off with a loss. They are two of the very best players in the field, but we're talking about a field of 68 phenomenal ones, four of which are already through, of course, given MPL Weekly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, this is going to be a tournament where great players are just running into each other over and over and over and over again, and not everyone can win. Yep. So someone's got to start off with a loss. This time it is Luis and Javier, and we'll see who walks out of this one with a W. Let's take a look at the opening hands here. We've got two lands in hand for LSV. He's going to keep it, likes what he sees, and a lot more land for Javier Dominguez. So now LSV is going to hope that he doesn't end up with Mana Screw, a case of the dreaded Mana Screw. Nobody likes that. Well, I'm really digging this hand for Luis because he's got interaction early and often. He yeah. kicked things off with the Duress, now he's going to play a Thought Eraser. Thought Eraser is not only going to get you a look yeah, at it's Javier's gonna, hand. It's going to leave Javier with a hand in land. But it will also allow him to surveil and find another land drop, which he's placed Ooh, on top of his deck. That is, the, that is the landiest hand I ever did see. All right. Javier Dominguez's library needs to start behaving and give him something to play because at this rate, he is in a pickle. I like the selection there from Luis and finding Command the Dreadhorde. These games are always going to go quite long. And with that in mind, ideally, you know that you want to find one of your game breakers. Command the Dreadhorde is that. Narset going to go active again and finding it Teferi. So Narset has done its job. It gave Luis an early play. It found a Command the Dreadhorde and Teferi. You really can't draw it up much better than that. The only thing now, if you're Luis, you're looking for is what Javier has plenty of. Oh, no. Look at this. He's He just, keep find, he just keeps finding land. And Teferi's going to come out here and get Dovin's Veto straight away. So any consideration to Thorny Ray's first there? No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. You want to you want to resolve your best cards and make Javier have it because you've already seen his hand and know he's flooding out pretty badly. So your goal is just, you know what, if you drew a counter spell, you better have it right now. And now I think we might see Luis I do just, something I, similar. I just want to mention, for a control match, these guys are playing at lightning speed. 
Well, they know what they need to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they know exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Luis and Javier both, which, you know, it, they are control decks, so they normally take a while, but they can be played quickly because you yeah. know what you need to accomplish. Land drops, planeswalkers, game-breaking spells. It's really that simple sometimes. And speaking of game-breaking spells, we have one. There we go. Come on, the Dread Horde resolves. We got Let's Basilica Bellhorn and Teferi on the board now for LSV. He is just going to keep drawing cards, untapping lands, playing pesky planeswalkers, and giving Javier Dominguez a hard time. Oh, but Javier Dominguez finding his own Narset part of Veils. Let's see if she can dig for anything useful. What do we find for Javier? Come on, the Dreadhorde of his own. Oh, uh, you're a little late. You're a little late to the party there, buddy. You gotta, yeah, you gotta show up on time if you want to win these games. Come now. So that's part of the reason that you saw Luis just fire off some of his high impact spells as well, right? You're asking about Teferi and the Dovin's Veto. Is there any thought into just playing Thought Eraser instead? No, you just make Javier have it. That's oh. all you do. And Javier's gonna probably try to do the same thing against Luis if the situation allows him to do so. Oh, we're gonna see Elder Spell dismissing two Narsets from the board, plusing to Fairy Hero of Dominaria to nine, allowing him to emblem, start blowing up stuff as lightly. he draws cards. We've also got a Night Veil Predator on the board, and Javier Dominguez has seen enough. He's yeah. like, no, thank you, I want none of this. <coughs> Let's go to game three, good sir. Yeah, when two great players are playing against each other in a control mirror, oftentimes you see players in a control mirror play very slow and methodically. Oh, not these guys, they're just like, <laughs> Nope, and the sideboarding isn't going to take long for either player either. They both know what they're trying to accomplish. Again, let's break it down very quickly before the third game. It's about land drops. It's about planeswalkers. It's about answering those planeswalkers. And then the next level of the game is let's cast some game-breaking spells. In that instance, it was Command the Dreadhorde. You yep. saw what happened when it resolved. Yes, yeah, so whoever gets to Command the Dreadhorde or all the planeswalkers first is likely to win this match. Let's see how game three goes between two of Magic's best players. Taking a look at the opening hands, we've got five lands, two spells. Good mix on both sides. Duress going to get rid of that Thought Erasure. I don't want you looking at my hand. Thank you very much. Running out the Hallowed Fountain tap. Nothing to do on first turn for LSV. Turn two, nothing for Javier Dominguez. I love the keep here for both players. Both players have plenty of lands. They have plenty of Planeswalkers. Javier is going to be able to get to the battlefield on the third turn of the game with Narset. Luis will be able to do the same thing with Teferi. So they are getting their ba they're getting their battlefields Ooh, built pretty quickly. Drawing quick. Elder Spell. That's a huge draw. That's going to be a very, very big card for Javier Dominguez as soon as these Teferis hit the board because he knows exactly whose names are on that Elder Spell. Yeah, but I had a feeling Ooh, Javier was going to do sure. this. Javier playing Narset and not activating it because both of Kaya could take care of it. I like that play a lot by Javier. We'll see if it'll come back to bite him because I'm sure he wants oh. another card. You know the very good card that Javier drew? It's now in the bin. Thanks to Thought Erasure from LSV. Just running out his lands. We're going to get set up here for Teferi and Teferi and Oath of Kaya. So Narset now digging through the deck. Let's find out what. Javier Dominguez spies. Search for his Kanta, that's pretty good. That's that's maybe the best find that he can find in this situation because Narset cannot find lands. Again, I talked about at the top about how land drops are very important in the matchup. Search for his Kanta is going to allow I'm Javier to get closer to finding them, but Narset doesn't, and Javier misses fourth land drop where Luis did not. Like you said, Oath of Kaya also getting rid of Narset, so no more pesky Narset on the board. We now have two Teferi Time Ravers in the hand for LSV, but Big T is going to make his appearance. He is down on the board. There are three Teferis in Javier Dominguez's hand, win. but he hasn't found that fifth land yet. He needs to get that. Love this play here from Luis <laughs> once again. You want to cut Javier's ability to find land drops. If Javier peels land five for his Teferi, so no be land. It. But that's not it. It's a Narset. It's a Narset, and Narset doesn't find lands, just finds spells. What are we looking for if we are Javier? What are we hoping for here? Well, you know Search for Escanta is an option. Duress isn't too bad Duress either because you can shabby. fire that off. There's no, no Tamiyo in this match, of course, so it's going to be <laughs> totally fine. But Luis has got the advantage now. He's got two Planeswalkers to one, as you can see. And here comes to Fairy Time Raveler. It's going to bounce Oath of Kaya, and that's going to allow him to take care of the Narset. Here we go. Oath of Kaya is on Narset duty today. Just, you know, keeping this uh, card from causing any too many disruptions or distractions. No time for a break. One of the problems here, too, for Javier in this game is though he has four mana, he can't actually deploy Basilica no, Belhaunt he because he only has access to one white mana. He just drew the second one. There but Belhaunt's too late. Teferi's got some real work to do. Oh, yeah. Let's see what Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, can do. We're going to tuck LSV's Big T back into the third spot in the deck. Watergrave off the top. Narset, Potter, Avails, and Duress available for LSV. 
Narsa taking the dig through the library, finding Dovin's nopes, as well as another Teferi here of Dominaria. They're just everywhere. Well, yeah, that's the fairy that got tucked away, oh, so yes, that one's yes, obviously going to come back. <laughs> we might see Luis fire off the duress here in just a moment, as Watergrave is going to be his land for the turn. Looks like he's going to play that and have it enter the battlefield tapped before passing the turn back. And duress in the draw set Ooh, is pretty Ooh, the nice. Elder Spell, but it's going to get duressed away. That is a big, big play for LSV. Keeping those Planeswalkers safe, those are going to win in the game eventually. So Javier needs to kill them. LSV needs to keep them safe. Teferi here of Dominaria still in the hand, but not much longer. Getting discarded by the Basilica Bellhaunt and Big T on Javier Dominguez's side of the board. Not drawing any cards because of Narset and finding an uh, Oath of Kaya on LSV's that's side. That's a huge draw from That's Luis. very good. That allows him to take care of this Teferi Hero of Dominaria. Teferi Hero of Dominaria is not great right now because of the Narset that's on the battlefield here for Luis. Luis is going to activate the Narset, choosing between Duress and the Elder spell at this stage of things, too. I think things are shifting back Luis's way at this stage. Okay, let's see how this proceeds. Very, very careful consideration here. What do we want to take? He knows, a, does he know about the, yes, he knows about the one to fairy. Doesn't know about the second. So let's see, what do we go for here? Elder spell? Okay. Sure, why not? To keep that in hand, maybe. Wait to see if there's, if that second to fairy hits the board. Luis now things have slowed down a little bit. Now both players are like, hmm. Well, Luis is one of the what fastest. Do I do here? He's one of the fastest players in the world. Everything comes very easily to Luis because he's played so much magic over the years. But he's got to think about the best way to use Oath of Kai and the Elder Spell because Basilica Belhaunt can check either one of these Planeswalkers. So Belhaunt, generally a card that's just average in this matchup, in this particular situation is actually looking quite good. So Luis has got some real thinking to do before casting this Elder Spell and how he wants to use it. So the Elder Spell is going to get rid of Big T and plus his own little T to get rid of the Basilica Bellhaunt. He will potentially lose Earth of Kaya. Oh, hello. Come on, the Dreadhorde. Welcome to the party, friend. <laughs> that's, that's the best draw. <laughs> Oh, LSV, Luxkill victory indeed. Bellhaunt's probably going to come down here, and Luis is going to very quickly discard Oath of Kaya. Oh, yes, that's going into the bin. No questions asked, because we know that Commander Dreadhorde wants to fish out everything else in the bin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Quick check on Luis's life total. I'm pretty sure it's 26. Oh, yeah, it's 26, yeah. He's, ha he's having a look in the, uh, in the library there of both players. Here Sorry, in nothing. the graveyard of both players, just to see what he can bring back. Oh, this is going to be a feels bad for Javier Dominguez. If this resolves, which I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, yeah, I mean, little yeah. little T's on the battlefield. There's nothing to worry about here. This is going to be a backbreaker. Luis has got a ton of life to work with. Not a single fear in the world. It's just how much stuff is he going to get back because he's looking at his graveyard and Javier's. Javier is totally defenseless against this card. It was a beautiful top deck there from LSV. Indeed it was. So pick, taking his pick of the Planeswalkers, which uh, both players have have access to. So look at all those Teferis. Double Narsets, triple Teferi. Yeah, that's what you want to see. Like you mentioned earlier, that's exactly what you want to see as the Esper control player. And now LSV is just, he's got the, the world as his oyster, as yes. you said earlier too. Yes, it is. He's going to bounce Basilica Bellhaunt once again. He's just cleaning up the battlefield now. He's found a large copy of Teferi to go along with the small one that he already has in the battlefield. I think I think Javier has already got a pretty good idea. If he's so far behind in this game, his search for his contest is going to come join the fray as well. That there's almost no way for him to come back. It's just too slow now. Luis has such an overwhelming advantage. Found a D spark off the top, but I think it's a little too late here for Javier Dominguez. We're going to see Big Teferi hit the board on Dominguez's side, and let's see. We are sending back the search for his cancer because we know when that flips, it's. You got a bit of you got a bit of a pickle to get through there. Yeah, well, Elder Spell is going to put the old check mark on this game. Luis is going to probably buffer his uh, his big Teferi and start vacuuming up permanents. The Narset activation the doesn't look so bad, but again, at the end of the day, Alias, what this matchup is all about: land drops, planeswalkers, yep. and then finding a game-breaking spell. Luis did that two of the games. Javier was only able to do it in one. It's really, really that simple. Here we go, and before. To fairy hero of Dominaria can even get his loyalty points. Javier Dominguez concedes to Luis Scott Vargas, who picks up his first win of the tournament. So congratulations to him.
Yeah, so what's interesting about the matchup very quickly is, again, that matchup, you hit those land drops, Javier had difficulty with that, we saw that, that's going to cost you a game. Who's got the Planeswalker advantage? Both players kind of went back and forth on that baton, and then who's got the Command the Dreadhorde advantage? Both players are playing two, it's going to resolve most, in most instances, pardon me, and then whoever resolves it first, no must, no fuss, game ends pretty fast, LSV got his to resolve game three, that's his first win on the weekend. All right, so more awesome magic coming up. We're going to an ad break. We'll be right back here in Las Vegas for Mythic Championship 3. I'm Alexander Hain. I'm from Canada and member of the MPL. When I really got into magic was college. Both my parents come from an academic background. So for them, success in school was, was number one. They didn't really understand. And then Saturday night of the Pro Tour, my mom got to meet me and the team at the, the event and ended up winning, and it was quite something. Since then, she's gone like full-blown fan of Magic. My name is Carlos Ramon. I'm former 2002 World Champion. I remember when I won my first invite to the Pro Tour, told my father, okay, so this is a professional Magic tournament. My father was like, you take like A grades on the school and then you can go. My family was always supportive since the beginning. Like without them, I wouldn't be able to be here. When I got the call, I heard, okay, so we're gonna sign you a contract. And I told my father and he was so excited. I remember that my mother picked up the phone and said, oh, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Without them, I couldn't achieve anything when it comes to the game. My name is Eric Froelich, I'm in the Magic Pro League and the Magic Pro Tour Hall of Fame. It just so happened that my entire fifth grade class really just started getting into Magic. I wanted to go to the local game store. I uh, went with my dad and we bought a nice little starter kit at the time. My dad ended up reading the entire rule book, teaching me how to play, and I played with my classmates. I ended up finding myself winning and winning and advancing all the way to the top eight and qualifying for the Pro Tour at 13 years old. And at that point, I was just fully immersed and wanting to go to every major tournament around me. And that's what I did. I was lucky enough to have really supportive parents who found a way to make sure everything I needed to go to, I was there. I'm John Rolfe from Omaha, Nebraska. I've been playing Magic for about 15 years. I played Pro Tour Ixalan, which I thought was gonna be my last Pro Tour, and I ended up top fouring the whole thing. And so then it gave me this awesome opportunity, and I've always wanted to pursue this, why not take a chance? And then I just kept winning, and now we're here, so. <laughs> When I got the call to join the MPL, at first I was just shocked. I had to think about it for a really long time, and Magic had been such a big part of my life that I had to at least see where the future goes. I mean, I didn't want to live with any regrets. with his opening hand. My name is Piotr Głogowski. I live in Poland, Poznań. I have been playing Magic since return to Ravnica before uh, joining the Magic Pro League. I have been streaming MTGO. I hope that uh, with the advent of the MPL and uh, Magic Arena, I can expand on that. I'm certainly not going to leave the older formats that I love in the dust. Draw two, discard two, and straight into the concession. Wow. Reed Duke equal. My name's Reed Duke. I'm a longtime professional Magic player, and I'm a member of the inaugural Magic Pro League this year. My uh, older brother Ian and I learned to play together, and I've started taking it real seriously once I was uh, around college age, and I've been a pro for about six or seven years. Declare my attack, says Reed Duke. Autumn says, you got it, and scoops up. I come from a tremendously supportive family, and my mother and I sort of have this joke that I'll come home, and she'll say, I was the tournament, and I'll say, Oh, well, I lost in the finals, or she'll say, well, you're still a winner to me. Hey, everybody, welcome back to coverage of Mythic Championship 3. I'm Marie Bertholdi. That's day nine. We're chilling like villains here at the news desk. And we've had a couple great feature matches in our feature match area, but we've got more magic to show you here. Highlights from feature match number three, William Huey Jensen versus John Rolfe coming up this round. Now, we are going in 
to see the entirety of game three tied yep. at one and one for these guys here. Yeah, they're tied one and one in the match, so it's game three there, but each of them is currently one and oh in terms of their standing, and it's going to be Esper Control versus William Jensen's Gruel Agro, I believe. The thing that's interesting about John Rolfe's list is that there's a lot of Esper Control decks here, but John Rolfe didn't have terribly much low-end removal, which is really essential against Gruel. All right, here we go. Things kicking off for John Rolfe and William Huey Jensen here. This is match number three, as you said. Oath of Kaya in hand for John Rolfe, which can do some damage. Oh and double Kaya's right. This is a beautiful opening hand from Jay Rolfe. But I mean, if you look over at William Jensen's side, you have Domri, you have Vivian, you have no creatures. No. And a Gruul deck no. is pretty, Where are the creatures, pretty dude? important to have some creatures in there. And I mean, these are the kinds of draws that you are you know, somewhat comfortable against these types of control decks. You know, Vivian Reed coming out can be extremely strong. But with the thought erasure off the top, John Rolf, you know, probably going to take some time, probably. That's right. Just and take a little peek here. Time Raveler helping him take some time, too. Yeah, I mean, there's a line of play where you can plus the Time Raveler then wait until the draw step for John Rolf Thought Eraser just to get the best possible deletion from the hand. But I mean, Vivian Reed is one of those cards that if she sticks against a control player, it is so obnoxious because a creature comes down, you gotta remove that, and then another one, and then another one, and it just keeps on piling up. And often, depending on how many Planeswalkers were seen in the early game, yeah, no, exactly and here we what go, we just talking what about. you said, Thought Erasure, taking a look at Jensen's hand, and yep, bye-bye Vivian Reed. Another guy's wrath. You know, oh, I don't even you know, need that one! You know, maybe that one will go to the <laughs> graveyard, I still have a few in hand, and just seeing if you're William Jensen, you see Kaya's Wrath go into the graveyard. That hurts oh, so much. I'm terrified. But nothing compared to the shame of playing a Llanowar Elf on any turn <laughs> but turn one. This this is the one true curse of running Llanowar Elves in the deck. I mean, right now, uh, Domri really gives a lot of extra value to all these creatures. No matter how late they're drawn, just that plus one damage on everything really begins to stack up. But currently, I mean, if I had to make the call right now, John Rolf is looking so good, just going to I mean, this is, just, elf. this is just nasty. It's a fairy time raveler. Send it back to your hand. Draw a card. It's an embarrassment of riches here. The rich get richer. Yeah, I mean, right now, Teferi big, Teferi small. Gonna draw, <laughs> just chill. It's it's hard to make mistakes at this point in time when you have this kind of hand. As John Rolf, is important to know. Oaths of Kaya, Kaya's Wrath, multiple opportunities to clear, but there's a few really sticky threats that you can hunt down if you're William Jensen. There's Arclight Phoenixes, Skargan Hellkites obviously will get removed from Kaya's Wrath, but going one for one is eh, maybe a comfortable position to be in, but at this point in time, just continuing to draw with Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. If there's an Elder spell in there, we have seen all day the Esper players Absolutely. using the Esper. Absolutely. Just killing their own Planeswalkers. It doesn't even matter if there's no Planeswalkers on the other side. Just to get that minus eight off on the Teferi. So Oath of Kaya eliminating the Llanowar Elf. There's a single Collision Colossus in hand. And I mean, I really feel like this reveals what William Jensen would have wanted to happen. <laughs> he wanted to kill fast. This is what he wanted? Fast. I mean, oh, okay. There's no flyers. You're not going to use the Collision side. You're going to use the Colossus. Get plus four, plus two. But hey, Growth Chamber Guardian, this, this could actually be a pretty significant opportunity. Well, talk about a sticky threat, right? This is one right here. It's got its friends baked right into it. it, it Right, right into it. So here comes a 3-2 thanks to Domri, but you can find some other guys, which can sometimes help you out, but I don't know. John Rolf's hand is just stacked. Yeah, I mean, this, I will say the Growth Chamber Guardian is one of those gruel cards that really gives you a lot of hope. It itself is a pretty beefy threat, especially with Domri. You're going to be able to just deal five damage per attack. And the Growth Chamber Guardian can just continue to seek out more cards in the deck. And going one for one, with, you know, Oath of Kaya's and Kaya's Wrath is only okay for a little bit. That is true. That is true. He's got to make something happen. All right, here we go. Uh, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, plus draw a card, finds a Hallowed Fountain. Teferi, Time Raveler. Let's see what he wants to do here. He's going to send that Growth Chamber Guardian back to Jensen's hand. It's, it's brutal right now because, I mean, even if William Jensen can begin to get momentum, Growth Chamber Guardian is going to go back to the hand. And then what's going to happen? Well, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, is at seven in loyalty, yeah, two turns terrifying. away, or excuse me, one turn away from just being able to minus eight. Yeah, ultimate, and take a look at uh, Huey's face too. Is, I think this tells a story in and of itself. Not feeling great here in this spot. And we're yeah. gonna, you know what's even worse? We're just gonna replace our little T here. We didn't even need to keep the other one on the battlefield. Yeah, let's just keep those options open. <laughs> 
why not? Yeah, big big Teferi, end of turn, untaps all these lands. And for William Jensen, you know, you can drop a threat. Sure. But let's not forget several turns ago, Akaya's Wrath was placed into the graveyard. That's right. You kind of know your opponent has Akaya's Wrath in hand. You feel it. Yeah. Or feel John Rolfe is awful. It's one of those two <laughs> possibilities, okay? Yes. One of those two. Yeah, this is kind of futile here. We've got a couple more Growth Chamber Guardians hitting the table, but like you said, Kaya's Wrath at the ready for John Rolfe. Yeah, and I mean, as, as it turns out, John Rolfe is not awful. He's one of the strongest Magic players alive. So, Absolutely. of course, just keeping Kaya's Wrath in hand, waiting until the last possible moment to get maximum value. We're going to go ahead and oh, <laughs> just... Oh, safety belt there. Oh, oh, oh it's just... This is, this is just the dream of an expert player where any possible threat you can just pick off from the hand with a Thought Erasure. You can clear with Akaya's Wrath. You have more cards in your hand than you know what to do with. I mean, this is why you play Control, right? So you can feel the feeling of ultimate power when this is your hand here at John Rolfe's disposal. William Jensen's Gruel deck, which I do think has some legs in this format, does have some possibility. It's not enough. All right, John Rolfe takes down this match over Hall of Famer William Huey Jensen. Awesome stuff there. Bringing Gruel mid-range can't fault him, though. Three players in the tournament with that mm -hmm. spicy deck there. So there you go. That is our feature match. But we've got another one coming up for you next round. All right, Day 9, Cedric, take it away. Who are we going to see? That is correct. We'll be watching Autumn Burchett battling with that Simic Nexus of Fate deck against Shota Yasuoka, who is, uh, I believe, running a just kind of typical-looking Esper Control. He's got a little something kind of interesting in yeah. his deck, though. He's playing a couple copies of main deck Bolus of Citadel. Oh, uh, that's right. So what I love about that selection is in a format of Esper decks, it's kind of a game breaker. Like we've seen with Command the yeah. Dreadhorde, it's a different way to go about doing it. Not going to play a huge role in this matchup. This matchup, uh, as we saw Autumn a little bit earlier today, mm -hmm. Sean, it's all about this. Autumn is playing Civic Nexus. Esper Control is generally a pretty tough matchup. Yeah. So has Autumn found a way to actually take care of that deck? Now, Autumn's already beaten... Esper Control once. Paul Vitro Domodoroso was playing, and right, Autumn was right. able to, to win that one. Can they do it again? That's the big question. I loved the way that Autumn played out that Esper Control matchup. Yeah. Because, you know, you like to think with your Simic Nexus of Fate deck, Wilderness Reclamation, Infinite Turns, that's what we got to go for. Get it as fast as you possibly can. Yep. But Autumn instead sideboarded in Thorn Lieutenants, Biogenic Oozes, and just one kind of swiftly. Well, the ability to control the narrative on the sideboarding is really interesting. If, if, if you see the creatures in the sideboard with open deck lists, am I bringing him in? Am I bringing him out? You have to try to figure that out because I get to control what I'm doing, and that makes it a lot of fun for Autumn. And I got to admit, I am so glad you reminded us about the Bolus' Citadel in the main deck for Shota. I'm really looking forward to this match. Yep. Let's head over to Becca to get the game started. Thanks so much, Day9. All right, I am so excited to see this match play out. Let's welcome to the stage the winner of the Mythic Championship 1 in Cleveland from this year. And